we pray about ourselves, for ourselves, and mostly about ourselves. If it's pertinent to me, then I pray about it. One thing that I've been convicted about recently is that my prayers, and the prayers that that I hear, I don't think I'm alone in this, our prayers are very different than the prayers that are in the Bible. They're They're not the same. As I study the Bible, I'm noticing different things about the way people pray in the Bible, and I think I don't really pray like that very often. So most on my prayers and our prayers, I think, things like health, you know, healings and surgeries, recovery, safety and travel is on there a lot, success and victory, usually personal, opportunities, pretty much anything related to making life easier or making us more prosperous. That's usually the way my prayers tend to go. Now, it's not wrong, bad to pray about these things. I mean, there are verses in the Bible that say we need to pray about all kinds of things. So it's not like, the idea is not to say we can't pray about these things. That's not what I'm saying at all. But if this is most or all of what we pray for, I think we have some room to grow. The first half of Ephesians... The whole first half, actually, is, is, a, is really a prayer. And it's kind of broken up different times by some bits of theology and some explanations about who God is. But it's really a, a, it's really a prayer if you read it closely. The whole first half of the book is. So, like, there's a couple verses. This is your Bible reading track for today, but there's a couple verses in that that I want to call your attention to. Let's look how Paul prays. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the gl- riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, look at Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 14 here. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. When Paul wrote Ephesians, he was in prison. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And then a little later on in 6.20, he talks about how he is an ambassador in chains. He's in prison here when he's writing this. And so he would have had many personal concerns. So think about it. If you were in prison, and particularly prison back then, There would have been a lot of things that you were concerned about. You would have been worried about an upcoming trial because jail back then was not a destination. It was not a sentence. It was a temporary place while you awaited trial. 
then they would hand out your sins. So if you were in chains, in prison, that means your trial was coming yet. You would have been worried about that. He would have been. How about safety? They're not exactly... There's, there's, no, there's no people worried about your civil rights back then. If you're a prisoner and something happens to you, you have to kind of worry about that. You have to kind of worry about other prisoners too. How about fair treatment by the guards? When you're a prisoner, you have no rights. How about adequate food? Most prisons back then, you had to rely on your family or friends to bring you food because they weren't going to feed you. These are some big concerns that Paul would have had when he wrote this. And you can read the whole book of Ephesians. Please do. He never asks for prayers about any of these things. Not at all. Instead, he prays for their spiritual growth. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 13, he tells them, hey, don't worry about my sufferings. Don't worry about that. He says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Hey, these sufferings, this is, this is your glory. Paul elsewhere talks about how when, when I am weak, then I am strong. So this is God's glory shining through me here. Another thing that he does, does here, he doesn't say, I will pray for your spiritual growth. He actually does in the letter, right there, right then, in black and white. He puts his prayer right there in that letter. A uh, habit that I'm in is to say, I'll, I'll pray for you. Something that I'm going to try to do and I hope that you would do too. Is to say, to say, I'll pray for you. Say, let's pray now. Let me pray for you right now. Just something short, something sweet. Be a blessing to that person right then. If you say, I'll pray for you, they, they don't get to hear your prayer. They don't know. You might even forget. Paul prays for them right now. If you look at what he prays for here, it says he kneels. He kneels before the Father. Back then, Jews, particularly Jews, they always stood to pray. Kneeling was something that was pretty extraordinary. That means that you were extra humble. Greater humility and urgency. That's what that's saying. If you kneel when you're praying, that means there's some urgency here. The urgency is about their spiritual growth. Not his safety, not their safety, not their prosperity or His. It's their spiritual growth. These are the most pressing concerns for Paul. And he prays for them that the Spirit would strengthen them from within. I pray that the Spirit would fill you and strengthen you from the inside out, he says. Verse 16 there. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. In your inner being. The Spirit lives within us. I pray that that Spirit wouldn't just sit there. I pray that that Spirit would grow and strengthen you from the inside. He prays that Christ wouldn't be in their heads. Only in their heads. But also their hearts. They were Christians already. He's not asking them, you know, I pray that Jesus would come into your heart like sometimes we say. He's not praying that they would become Christians. He's praying that Christ would fill their hearts. Because we tend to have little corners of our hearts that we like to keep for ourselves. And, you know, Christ can have maybe most of it, but, you know, we like to have these little things that 
that we want, right? He prays that Christ would dwell in their hearts so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. They are younger Christians and Christ needs to be their number one desire. He prays that they would grow in the faith that they have. It's easy to just say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, to have that intellectual assent. Yeah, I agree with these things. But is Christ dwelling in our hearts? Is He our desire? Is He our passion? Is He what gets us going in the morning? That's a whole different thing. Paul prays, I pray that Christ would fill your hearts and that He would be your one desire, your reason for getting out of bed every morning. He prays that their love for one another would show them Christ's love. 17 and 18, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to know, grasp rather, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. I pray that you would be able to grasp that together so that you would know this love here. And that comes from your love for one another. He spends a lot of time in Ephesians saying, hey guys, love one another as Christ has loved you. He spends a lot of time on that. And the reason why is because the Ephesian church, this is a, Ephesus was a big, busy city. It was probably the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And there were lots of people coming through here. Big cities are like that. All different kinds of people coming through. Business and all different kinds of reasons, right? So there were, in this church, there were Jews and Gentiles. And back then, especially, this meant very different lifestyles. If you were a Jew, you ate certain foods in a certain way. You even washed your hands in a certain way. All of this. If you were Gentile, you didn't have those rules. And so you had two different, very different kinds of people at work here. And so he's very concerned that they aren't going to get along and they're not going to work together very well. Guys, you are one in Christ. Therefore, love one another. Work together. You're different. Big deal. So what? You're one in Christ. That's what's most important. I pray that as you love one another, even though you're very different, that you would know Christ's love because he loves both of you, all of you. And if he loves all of you, then you can surely love one another. And I pray that you would experience his love as you love one another. That's my prayer for you. He prays that they would know what is at least humanly anyways, unknowable. I pray that you would know what is unknowable. Something that nobody can understand. Verse 19. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. That you would know the unknowable. This, this, is, this is why Paul is kneeling. I, I kneel before the Father. This is urgent. I pray that you would know this love that Christ has shown us. It's, it's beyond anything that we can imagine. I pray that you would know that. Of all the things that are important in life, this is what I am praying for. That you would know what Christ's love is. And then he closes by glorifying God for His power that works in us. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to His power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the, in the church in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. To God be the glory. In his prayers, Paul almost always prays about spiritual matters. Almost always. If you look through the New Testament, this is the kind of thing that he prays about. He prays about the people that he's witnessed to, that he's brought Christ to, and he's praying that they would continue to grow in this knowledge and in this faith that has started in them. Who cares about the other stuff? This is what's most important. 
Here's just one here. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. He goes on and on about this. My prayers don't look like that. I don't know about yours. When Paul does ask for prayers for himself, it's always for the purposes of the gospel. Because Paul is an apostle. He's on a mission. He's on a mission to bring the gospel to new new places all the time. And so when he is concerned about himself, he's worried because the gospel needs to go forth. So Romans 15, 31 and 32. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there. So that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and together you will be refreshed. So he's not worried just because of his safety. He's worried about, he's worried about other people. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not everyone has faith. It's about the gospel going forth. It's not just keep me safe. It's, Lord, the gospel needs to go forth. So please pray so that we can be safe and the gospel can continue. He wasn't concerned about his health or even his life. The last time he saw the Ephesians, it actually is recorded in Acts, Acts chapter 20. And here's one thing that he said in his final speech to the Ephesians. I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That's what my whole life is about. And whenever God says enough, I'm done. But that's what my life is about. That's all. I, as far as I'm concerned, I don't, I don't need this life. And he prayed these kinds of prayers even when these churches were undergoing some very difficult circumstances. This spiritual growth stuff is not just limited to churches where people were doing okay, pretty well, not so much persecution, have enough to eat, pretty safe. He did it to all his churches. He prayed these prayers for them too. So he prayed these prayers even when there was persecution and poverty. There were some churches that he started in places where They were constantly in danger and under harassment and places where they were dirt poor. And he still prays about spiritual growth. So, for example, Thessalonica. The Thessalonians. He wrote two letters there. When he went there at first, there were a bunch of people who were converted there, including some, it says, many prominent people. Some people who had some high position, lots of respect. But right after that, there was this big riot because of so many people believing in Jesus. There was a whole riot in the city. And after that, it was so, such a violent riot that Paul was forced to leave, actually. And after that, they faced intense persecution based on what we know from the letters. And they were suffering a great deal because of it. We don't know exactly what was going on or what kind of persecution it was, but they were being persecuted, and it wasn't good. Paul speaks of them being in severe poverty. So it's very easy to imagine that there were some very wealthy, prominent people who came to know Christ in Thessalonica. And because they came to know Christ, 
they lost their position. They lost their jobs. They lost their respect in the community. And now they are dirt poor. And when Paul prays for the Thessalonians, here's, here's one, one thing here. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of His calling and that by His power He may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that God the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, that he may count you worthy of his calling. Even when they were facing intense persecution. So as I've been looking at some of these prayers and reflecting on my own prayer life, I kind of came to this thought here. Our prayers are mirrors to our hearts and our faith. The way that we pray is kind of like holding up a mirror to our heart. It's like holding up a mirror to our faith. What is it that we really believe about God? And what's really in our hearts? And then James chapter 4 comes to mind. You'll read the whole thing this week in your Bible reading tracks, but it says, You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. In other words, the people that James is writing to, you know, you're not talking to God about the things that you need, and when you do, all you're doing is praying because of your selfishness, just greed and things that you want. And then he says this, Come near to God and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Kind of a hard-hitting challenge there. If you look at the Lord's Prayer, even, it's not, not as much of what I pray about either. Look at, uh, look at the screen here. What does the second request of the Lord's Prayer mean? Your kingdom come means rule us by your word and spirit in such a way that more and more we submit to you. Keep your church strong and add to it. Destroy the devil's work. Destroy every force which revolts against you and every conspiracy against your word. Do this until your kingdom is so complete and perfect that in it you are all in all. This is the first request of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. I've been treating God kind of like an ATM machine where I insert the prayers and God gives me what I need. And that's not the way the Bible portrays prayer at all. Yes, God does give us what we need. And we are to ask about the things that we need. But there are big things to pray for. So let's pray big. Less personal problems and more Christ's kingdom. Not that we don't have personal problems, but there are bigger things involved here. To the point where even if we were being persecuted and we were dirt poor and we didn't know where our next meal was going to come from, we would still be praying for spiritual growth because that's the most important thing. It always fascinates me when I read about people who are persecuted and they say, Don't pray for the persecution to end. That's not what we want. Pray that we may be strong through it and that God may be glorified in it. That's a recurring thing. There was one guy I read about where he went to China 
to visit people who were being very persecuted because of their faith. And at the end, he asks to pray for them, and he does. But then as, after, as he says amen, they start praying for him. And they pray for him that he would experience persecution. That was their prayer for him. Because they knew that persecution builds them up in faith and it reveals God to them. It strengthens them spiritually. And he said, the whole plane ride home, that prayer just disturbed me. But today, he says, I see exactly why they prayed that for me. Let's pray for God's kingdom. Let's pray for God's people. There was one thing I saw this week on Facebook. I'm not going to say who it was, but it's somebody who belongs to our church. Listen to this. I pray daily for wisdom, patience, and safety for my kids and babies, but most of all, that you will know the saving love of Jesus Christ. That's it. Most of all, that you would know Jesus Christ. Pray big. So here's some suggestions for our prayers this week. Let's pray for specific people to be saved in Christ. We all know people who don't know the Lord or we might not know where they are with the Lord. Let's pray for them by name and say, Lord, Please enter so-and-so's life. Please enter their hearts. Please work on them. Draw them to you so that they would know who you are and that they would have that saving knowledge of you. Romans 10 verse 1, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Ask for opportunities to share faith. Ask for opportunities to give our testimony. Tell about what Christ has done for us. Let's pray for God's word to speak and at the right times. Let's pray for the strengthening of Christ's church. This was what Paul mostly prayed about. The church is constantly under threat from within and without, and there are big things at stake. People's faith is at stake here. Let's pray for the strengthening of our church, that we'd be grounded in the truth, and that we would have that love for one another so that we would know Christ's love. Instead of just praying about bodily health, which is important, but it's not it. Let's pray for spiritual health. Let's pray for Christ Christ to dwell in hearts and not just heads. Let's pray that we might show incredible love to one another, that we might experience God's love for us. Instead of praying for escape from trouble, let's pray for God to shine. We would love to be free from troubles and problems and difficulties. But more than that, let's pray for God to shine through it so that whether we succeed or fail, whether things are easy or hard, that God would be revealed in our lives. Christ's example on the cross is that victory is in defeat. Riches are through poverty Joy is through suffering, glory is through shame, and life comes through death. This is our example. This is the truth. So whether we succeed or fail, whether things are going well or not, let's pray that God would shine in our lives. That people would see it. And instead of I'll pray for you, say let's pray now. I want to put that out there one more time. Instead of saying, I'll pray for you, say, let's pray now. Right now. The next time somebody posts something, a prayer request or a concern on Facebook, for example, instead of saying, I'll pray for you, why don't you write out a sentence that's a prayer? And instead of just praying for their physical health or relief from trouble, add something in there saying that God would shine through, through them in this. 
Pray big. And let's pray for God to be glorified. Let's pray for God to be glorified. This is how Paul ended his prayer. That's a good way for us to end ours too. That in all things, Lord, that you would be glorified. Now and forever. In the church, in our lives, through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, we we all could grow in our prayers, in our walk with you. Uh, Lord, it's easy to pray selfishly, but Lord, help us to pray big. Teach us to do that. Give us the words to speak so that, Lord, your church would grow and that you would shine and that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.